Hello, we are back here in the Ways and Means Committee. I think we're on like our fifth bill of the day, but we are getting it done and I appreciate everyone's work so far. Um, so I have an amendment to offer the committee um, on 829 um, and all, there are a few pieces of it that I want to explain. Um, the first one is that essentially um, out of mathematical convenience, our first amendment that we voted out um, removed the percentages from statute as a way of dividing up the trust fund. Those percentages, um, for good or for not, and I think sometimes for not, um, are always not withstood in every budget bill. However, um, they are a really important part of our commitment in an ongoing way of the relationship between property purchases and um, investments in housing and conservation. And that's a promise that we've had in Vermont for a long time. And so given the extra time, given the extra time between when we um, moved this bill along and um, where we are now was able to work with our absolutely amazing staff um, and figure out a way to have those percentages work. <laughs> um, figure out a way to have the percentages um, be restored and still be mathematically consistent with both intent and the activities of the budget. Um, so the amendment restores those percentages. What it's gonna look like when Kirby takes, it through up, takes us through it is that the percentage for um, housing basically stays the same, but that represents more real dollars. And the percentages for the other um, disbursements lowers, but that represents the exact same amount of real dollars, um, which would of course grow as you know we move through time and things inflate. Um, so that's one amendment. The other is um, with huge apologies to the wider universe and all water bodies everywhere. Um, accidentally um, cut the clean water funding. And that was not an intention at all. And that percentage has been tweaked to be fixed. Um, it was a lining up of thresholds and it wound up um, costing the clean water fund, um, I think about $700,000. And so that is now fixed. Um, and so apologies to all the water everywhere and everyone who loves water. Um, and then the last piece is um, I think the biggest sort of piece of humility I have here. We have been talking about this property transfer tax increase in this committee for a very long time. And we voted it out, I think three times last biennium. I don't, maybe more than that. We just kept on voting it out and putting it on things. Um, and so we did not spend all that much time talking about that $600,000 threshold because we had agreed on it so many versions on that in ways and means. But the world is a different place than it was last biennium and property values have grown a lot since then. Um, and we certainly talk about that a lot in the context of the CLA, but we also talk about it in other places. And so the third amendment is to actually have that new property transfer tax kick in at $750,000. And that means that the rate is going to be tweaked slightly. The last piece of the amendment that Kirby will take us through, I shouldn't say last because maybe I skipped something because I'm really just talking off the top of my head right now, just dangerous these days, um, is that Representative Taylor, who very kindly and valiantly um, chaired our mobile home task force this summer and did an enormous amount of work on behalf of manufactured homes um, and folks who live in them, um, suggested an amendment um, to this that is also included um, to make sure that manufactured homes are um, part of sort of the group that is exempt from the property transfer tax at the lowest level. So that was my general intent in bringing this amendment to the committee, and I will now let Kirby explain it all better than I just did. And then after Kirby explains it, Ted will explain the math part. So we don't need to ask Kirby to explain the math part because that's going to be Ted's job. Kirby's going to talk about the words. And then we're going to hear from um, someone from Gus from the Housing Conservation Board and Peter Gregory from, on behalf of the Planning Commissions. So Kirby, close yours. I will stop talking. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, okay. So as Chair Kornheiser 
was just explaining, we have, it's an individual amendment uh, from the chair on Ways and Means Committee report to HA29. And I will run through the changes and show you the language. The first instance of amendment on the first page here uh, changes the value that is taxed at the 1.25% rate. Um, up to, it, it was up to 600,000, it's being changed up to 750,000 before the higher rate kicks in. Uh, I'll refer to that as the threshold because um, there's no accurate and easy way to, to refer to, to that, the value that's taxed at you know, lower or higher rates. But so the threshold is being changed to 750,000. Uh, the top rate in order to accommodate the revenue change is also being changed from 3.25%, which was what was proposed before, up to 3.65%. And that language is in three different places, and that's why there are a lot of words on the first. <laughs> uh, that's my favorite way anyone ever explains an amendment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the second instance of amendment is uh, the change that was mentioned before. Uh, increasing the clean water surcharge rate from 0 0.2 to 0 0.22. Uh, that increase is to offset the threshold change for the clean water surcharge, where it did not apply, it, under current law, it does not apply to the first $100,000 of value. The underlying bill here, uh, uh, or the underlying amendment to the bill, uh, would change that threshold from 100,000 to 200,000. So uh, there's a revenue impact to the Clean Water Fund there that was estimated to be about $700,000. This rate change compensates for that. The third instance of amendment involves striking out several sections that were related to the allocations that Pleasure. the committee had done before. Those allocations can be off of um, allocating flat amounts to the three funds and uh, the general fund, the, uh, the trust fund for VHCB and the municipal or regional planning fund. Those were, those were going to be flat amounts. Well, it was going to be flat amounts for the first, for the first two, and then there was going to be a waterfall to the general fund. Uh, those sections are removed going back to the percentage allocations that are under current law. There are some changes I'll show you uh, with those percentage allocations, but uh, this bill would not go as change things for allocations as, as differently as, as what was proposed before. Um, so when it comes to the allocations uh, on page two, line three, we have a change to the percentage that PVR would get uh, for administration. If that changes from 2%, to 1.5%. And again, as Ted will explain in more detail, none of this is intended to have any real dollar impact whatsoever. It's intended to sort of restore a relationship in statute. Uh, so this is a new section 21. Again, the, the old sections about allocations are removed here. Um, you can't see that, but, but the leading language does that. Uh, section 22 is deleted. Uh, that was one of the allocation sections. 23, section 23, the new section 23 uh, is the allocation for the municipal and regional planning fund. The percentage that's in statute is being changed from 17 to 13. And these are these things are not withstood on a regular basis. So it uh, doesn't match what what tends to happen these days. The general fund. Uh, percentage is changing from 33 to 37. You will not see the VHCB trust fund language here because it's staying as it is in current law at 50%. Which represents more money. And then we have the budget language for the allocations. This was taken from the current version of the budget that's being worked on uh, by the appropriations committees. Uh, it's 
verbatim what is currently being proposed for allocations from the property transfer tax revenue. Uh, you'll see first it's uh, a little over 575,000 for PVR for administration, 22.1 million to VHCB. From, this is all from the property transfer tax revenue that we're talking about. Uh, the first two and a half million uh, will go to the housing bond. Uh, my reading of this is it looks like it reflects what's in statute where the first two and a half million is, is to go to the housing bond. Um, and then there's, and then a, and a million of that comes from the clean water surcharge first, the first million from the clean water surcharge. And this is essentially that sort of same notwithstanding language that we tend to see in budget in the budget that we rarely see in this only that that yes this is this is the budget notwithstanding language that gets talked about and um, it's just included in this form there's uh 7.7 .7 million for the municipal regional planning fund this is all for fiscal year 25 in case i wasn't clear about that uh the disbursements here um as far as I, I didn't do any math here but it looks like it roughly reflects how the statute has uh these funds dispersed and that's it for the budget language and finally the the fourth instance of amendment uh here um is the property transfer tax exemption that the chair had mentioned this is for and a, a property tax, a property transfer tax exemption for transfers of a new mobile home. Uh, so would not apply to any that are already, you know, out there that are in the ground or a fixed property, anything like that. It's a new mobile home. Um, the definition for that is from 10 VSA 6201, which lays out uh, the ba it's a basic definition that also brings in um, the requirements that HUD has for mobile homes. Um, but to use the exemption, the, the new mobile home would also have to uh, bear a label evidencing greater, greater energy efficiency provided under the Energy Star program, which is, and then there's the um, citation to the federal law for the Energy Star program. And then there were some effective date changes here. Uh, the first one is kind of a clarification from the amendment from before. If you remember, there was language that uh, inflated the threshold amounts going forward. Um, by the way, uh, some of the background research that I've done recently to um, help Representative Andrews actually prepare for the floor was looking back at the history of this and uh, it was 1988 when these thresholds were put in and when the property transfer tax rate was changed from 1 to 1.25. The uh, threshold amounts have not been changed since 1988. Uh, so this is the first time that, that they're being updated. And then now there's this inflator so that another, how many every years? 30 something years. We won't have yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so it's that inflator that this clarifying effective date language uh, makes sure that the, the inflator doesn't get done in 2024 because this will come into a law and then a month or two later have the department adjust the inflator. It's it's going to wait until 2025 for, for that to be done. And, <laughs> you know, in terms of how we try to, like, make reports be December 15th, um, and I think this isn't just my thing anymore. I think other people are on board with it. Um, when we come across a bracket somewhere that doesn't have an inflator att attached to it, it's just like, let's try to attend to it. I think sometimes purposely there are inflators put on things, but let's try to attend to it and add them. And the last effective date change is just, this is just uh, an effective date for the budget section that was added uh, that we just went through. And that's the floor amendment. Questions for Kirby before we go to Ted? Seeing none, thank you. I am not gonna make a flowery speech on the floor about how much I appreciate our staff because um, our former care trained me not to do such things. However, I will take this moment to just say, I like my appreciation for you Kirby and joint fiscal as a whole is just 
over here, 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 here. The appreciation. <laughs> and I'm not going to buy you a key or a cookies because I know you have too much sugar hanging around your offices right now. So I will we will find another way to thank you. Socks. Perhaps socks. Yes. <laughs> I'm. Where did that come from? I'm kitchen. I don't usually use braces. Ted, thank you. Yes. Well. I did not get, oh my gosh, into, there we are. This one. Give you all more, a longer chance to think about ways. Thanks, staff. Um, <laughs> you devil, you. Okay. So in order to talk about how the math would work with this amendment, um, I'm going to run through the um, budgetary allocations and language from fiscal year 25, and then go to the percentages, which would um, take effect in fiscal year. It would take effect currently, but would with because of the, the budgetary language that, that's in the amendment, um, fiscal year 26 would be the first time that these um, <clears throat> percentages would would adjust um, property transfer tax revenue. Um, so in this, in B and C, where my cursor is here, this is um, language that's currently in the budget without the additional revenue um, in 829. Um, and so in the, the columns with 829, it's essentially showing that there's an extra $17.5 million going to the general fund by keeping the amounts that go to the um, Conservation Trust Fund and the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund, the same as what's currently in the budget. The waterfall with additional general fund revenues going to the general fund means that there's $17.5 million to um, pay for housing appropriations that are currently in the bill. Um, moving to percentages, this is where it gets a little more fun. Um, the and this should say, sorry, this should say one and a half for tax. Um, I didn't change it from above. Um, but in fiscal year 26, we didn't um, account for any additional revenue um, differently than in fiscal year 25 from the changes to um, threshold values and rates. But there is kind of a base increase um, from the revenue forecast. Um, and that means with the current law allocations, these would be the values you would have 18 and a half going to the general fund, 28.1 million going to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund, and then approximately 9.5 million going to the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund. That's the 17%. Um, when you adjust the percentages, um, after reflecting, I should mention the, the statute, it's statutorily mandated that the bond payment happens first and the Department of Taxes gets there piece of it, again, this should say 1.5% instead of two. Um, you have $27.2 million going to the general fund, um, 36.9 almost going to the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund, and $9.6 million going to the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund. And in this column all the way here, um, it shows the difference from fiscal year 26 current law. So by decreasing, um, the municipal and regional planning fund um, allocation from 17 to 13 percent. The difference with the additional 17 and a half million dollars of property transfer tax revenues means that they would receive an extra $28,000. So it's essentially holding them the same. There are additional amounts going to the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund and the general fund. Both of these would pay for appropriations and investments in housing, um, intended investments in housing in fiscal year 26. As well as all of the personal income. Exactly. Yeah, which is, we're not, is not part of this amendment, but it's of course part of the bill. Yes, in that sense. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure this is really, really cool. I'm catching up here. Um, are the estimates on the lab? The uh, current formula or the actuals when they've not listed? So these, in fiscal year 26, this column shows the, I will highlight them, 
these numbers here show the current law allocations. In this column here, this is showing the adjustment um, in percentages. So taking the 17% for the municipal and regional planning fund down to 13%, and then taking the general fund from 33% to 37%. <clears throat> And again, this is all coming kind of in, within the context of these allocations have been historically not withstood for decades. But maybe we'll stop doing that. Who knows? <laughs> That'd be great. That's certainly the intent of this bill is that we would stop doing that. And then finally, just to provide the numbers, um, it is almost an, an exact kind of revenue neutral for the clean water fund by changing the rate from 0.2 to 0.22. Um, the estimated revenue would increase. Um, and this is in fiscal year 25 from 8.24 million to 8.3 million, an increase of $60,000. Any more questions for Ted? I guess I, I, I see we have impacted folks in the room. I assume we'll hear from them. We will indeed. Uh, they are next on the agenda. Um, Chris. Do you have any, I was trying to look it up here real quick, but do you have the historical data back, I don't know, 10 years, what property transfer tax revenues look like? I certainly do, and I can provide it um, to you on the committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks for that. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Ted, I've been assuming that the mobile home impact, manufactured home, excuse me, impact is low. You know, you've not had a lot of time to think about it. Where is your thinking going on that? My, I would wanna comb through the data again to double check. My sense is, um, the number of mobile homes that are transferred as real property is quite limited every year. And so to the extent that's true and I'm able to verify it, um, it would come back as nominal. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, just to clarify what you just said, Ted, I thought what the bill said about mobile homes is not properties or um, manufactured homes that are transferred, but purchased new. Which I'm using that as a oh, transfer. Okay. Uh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. I, because it's a property transfer tax, I have to okay. transfer with all of these mechanics. Otherwise, I'll just get I interpreted too deeply. Yep. <laughs> I, think we'll mm -hmm. I think we're good. Or, yeah. Do you want, you want elaboration, representative managers? I think okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, would you like to join us? <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to join us. I know you are asked to be in a few different places at once today. So. Yes, three places at once. Um, for the record, Gus Seelig, I'm the Long and the Tooth Director of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And I want to just start by giving all of you enormous thanks for the heavy lifting you're doing on this bill. Appreciate the amendment, we support it. Um, you've given and joint fiscal invited me two years in a row to give you an orientation. I think in both those orientations, I said when the one-time funding from the federal government is gone, and surpluses are gone, we would need to look to raising revenue to meet the housing needs of Vermonters. Um, and so you have my deepest appreciation because this has been the biggest chunk of my life's work. Um, and it touches every one of our communities. And I think in three fundamental ways. Uh, one is the workforce. Um, I was in the other body the other day, but the average childcare worker in the state is at $30,000 a year. Teachers in elementary school, the average wage is 61,000. Cop police officers, 60,000. And the cost of housing has gone up so much that none of those occupations are going to get you into housing that you can afford at this point. We've seen the cost of housing double since over the last six or seven years. Um, so there's just an enormous need. The second piece of it that your friends uh, across the hall have been dealing with is the problems of GA and unhoused Vermonters. Mm -hmm. That's at a crisis proportion. Um, and the third 
having been to Barry right after the floods is the need for recovery. So there are a ton of needs. We are just at the beginning, finally, of moving 26 folks out of the floodway at Tri Park into highly energy efficient homes that should happen this summer. So there's enormous need all over the state that we do not have the resources to meet. And I just want to like, so people might have the context of Tri Park. Tri Park is um, a manufactured home community in my district um, that is the largest cooperative mobile home park in the state. And the flooded properties that Gus is referring to are from Irene. And so, and it's not like no one's been working on it all this time. Um, and so <laughs> that is the scale of sort of how long we need to be investing and focusing on this work is real. And I appreciate you naming it. So taking a long-term approach of a decade to look at the needs for, to address this problem, I think is really just my highest compliments for the work that you're doing. For those of you, it's been several years since I've been in this committee. So very briefly, we do single family home ownership. We support manufactured home communities. With the pandemic money, we've begun a program for farm worker housing to improve that. We have supported all the shelters in the state and added almost 200 beds to our shelter system. We are contemplating more proposals along those lines right now. We do something called service supported housing. Uh, we just work with Pathways Vermont to double the capacity of a facility serving uh, youth with suffering from schizophrenia. We've doubled the capacity of the organization that serves uh, survivors of domestic violence uh, in Rutland County. We tripled it in Chittenden County with the facilities. So across the state, whatever the housing needs are, um, we're there. Um, as your staff just said, and my great appreciation to Joint Fiscal, who I've had the pleasure of working with for many years, um, transfer tax was first adjusted in 1988. Um, and that was part of some, a piece of Governor Cunin's le landmark legislation to en enhance our planning capacity and to support the Housing and Conservation Board, which we were then in our infancy, a year old as a uh, non-regulatory mechanism to help willing buyers and willing sellers deal with the problems that emanated from our real estate market. And the thought about tying our funding and regional and local planning to the transfer tax was that it was the measure of pressure in the real estate market and that it would likely outpace that uh, and uh, it's been proven over years, um, the general rate of inflation. Uh, and I think we've certainly seen that recent years, the cost of real estate along with the cost of construction. So I think um, people always debate the question of dedicated funds, but I think in this case, it makes it's wise both because of the work you ask us and our friends in the planning commissions to do. Um, it's also wise because it helps people understand where their tax dollars should go. Um, appropriators tend not to like the flexibility. And while in most years, there's notwithstanding language. I just want to also point out that in years of surplus, you provided us with amounts greater than the transfer tax would allow. Um, and actually, without this infusion, um, we will, with the governor's proposed budget, the one that's in the big bill, have the lowest level of funding that we've had for housing since 2017. Because you'll remember that you did a housing revenue bond with the governor that provided us additional funding beyond the transfer tax, beyond the capital but bill for those that supported us right up until 2020 when you then provided us funding from the coronavirus relief fund first grant. So um, yes, there's always notwithstanding, but the legislature is also, and this governor have been very supportive of affordable housing. Um, so we really appreciate the effort um, and we understand that the general increase that is being appropriated, uh, assuming there's not more notwithstanding language, is to be used to meet housing needs. And we have that commitment to you. Uh, I don't know if you need anything else from me, but I really appreciate the heavy lift that this is. I know it's never easy to raise re revenue. And just one more note on an alum from Joint Fiscal, uh, Steve Klein uh, and a bunch of volunteers in. Uh, in Montpelier have been supporting refugee families from Afghanistan. This is a hard market to keep people in. We've just done a project with them in Downstreet Housing. 
and just help them purchase their first home for a refugee family resettling here. So although Steve is not here with you every day, he's still doing the work out in the community. Really appreciate it. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Odie. Just, I was moving too fast. No, not at all. It's just it's late to the pan race. Um, so you said you're helping Afghan refugees. Are you also helping refugees and other from other places? Yes. Uh, I mean, we don't. We haven't done a program around that, but yes, our partners have been working with uh, new American families consistently. The House, Champlain Housing Trust in particular is housing lots of new American families uh, in the old north end of Burlington. They also did converted that school as a community facility, and there are a lot that's being used actively by the new American community. Uh, we actually have a conservation project, the Pine Island Farm, that just transferred to the ownership of a new American. Um, so. In particular, I mentioned Afghanistan because that's who the refugees are in Montpelier right now that Steve and a whole bunch of other volunteers are working with. But um, yes, we're working with wide ranges of new Americans. So the, in this amendment, the change from 17 to 13% for regional appointment. Um, you should discuss that with uh, Mr. Gregory. Um, I understand that the idea is to keep the dollars at the same level and to keep tied to the transfer tax, which while it, there are some years where it dips a little bit, ultimately goes up and goes up greater than the rate of, um, of inflation. Thanks. Thank you, Doc. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Gregory, can you join us? Thank you. <clears throat> Very welcome. Record, my name is Peter Gregory. I'm executive director of the Rivers Adequichi Regional Commission. We serve 30 small towns in Orange, Northern Windsor County, primarily. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting me here. Members of the committee, it's uh, good to be before you. I don't think I ever have been before Ways and Means. So we're glad to have you. Well, thank you. Hope to be back as often as needed. Um, on this amendment, um, you know, I also would like to thank uh, Gus and his staff for the fantastic work they've done. Uh, my entire career up here, it's been a pleasure working with him in a program that has been nationally recognized as just stellar and addressing the needs that we have here um, as they relate to economic development and quality of life and equity. And it's just been a pleasure working with all of them. Um, Gus did mention, and you did too, Madam Chair, about the notwithstanding that has uh, plagued the regional planning commissions and the municipal planning grant program for many years. Probably about $20 million has been not withstood over the, over the last couple of decades. That's significant dollars that could have gone a long way in helping our communities prepare for the floods that have been coming more and more frequently and the land use work that is now being recognized as being essential to the Act 250 reform. But we are where we're at. And we believe this amendment will lessen the chances of notwithstanding. So we support uh, this amendment as proposed. I also support the fact that additional revenues are being raised to invest in housing. That's absolutely directly related to what we do in our communities uh, and the, the staff that we need in our organizations and our businesses. Uh, so it, uh, it's, it's one big picture and everything is so interrelated. So I appreciate the committee looking at it that way and um, want to be a resource for you, but uh, this, this is something we support. Thank you. Um, so grateful for our RPCs and the critical work that they do, um, supporting our town's technical assistance, grants, day-to-day -day help, um, visioning, uh, <clears throat> and um, also kind of recognize that our RPCs serve really different size areas. And so I, I guess I'm curious to hear whether you feel like the current funding formula that distributes the revenue from the PPP is adequately uh, resourcing all of our RPCs in an equitable way to ensure that all of our towns get the support they need from our RPCs. 
That's a very good question. Um, the concept of every community having access to the, what they need uh, to thrive is, is a good one, one that we all support as members of RPCs. Ten years ago, we initiated kind of an independent review of our capacity and our quality of work and our coverage and our programming. And um, like I said, that was 10 years ago, we're initiating the same kind of study where an independent body will come in and look at all the programs we have, whether we're adequately resourced, whether there's equity in uh, access to uh, technical assistance across the, the state and size uh, and funding of the different regional planning commissions. So those questions all are going to be part of a scope of work that we're working on now. And uh, I think it will be very important for us as regional planning commissions, our towns, and the legislature to see the results of that. Great. Really looking forward to that work and those results. And thank you. You know, glad to see that we're making efforts here to ensure that you all are adequately resourced to do your really better work. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Finney. I keep Just, uh, one question the, about the interface between the planning commissions and the state's uh, graphic, geographic information cadre group. Right. Uh, because of the work that we are uh, reviewing right now, there's going to be an increased burden on mapping mm -hmm. capacity around uh, that's mostly Active 50, but not entirely. Right. And I recall during our um, work on uh, redistricting, we really leaned heavily on GIF. I wonder, uh, I'm delighted that more money is, is going to the capacity of the regional planning folks. I'm wondering if the relationship between the regional planning folks and GIF uh, is solid and whether GIF is sufficiently robust to, to sort of assist in the increased burden in, in mapping and planning. <clears throat> Very good. We can point. have John Adams in on a different topic if you need that at some point, Representative. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome to respond. Okay. okay. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have a good relationship with uh, VCGI and have for, for a number of decades. They um, typically set the standards uh, that all the regional planning commission technical staff follow. The heavy lifting uh, for the mapping effort on Act 250 and all that we do is really uh, on the regional planning commissions. Okay. So the resources that we've received, the bump bumps in the last couple of years, uh, has enabled us to be positioned to do the work with the Act 250 and beyond with the, the standards and, and oversight and quality control of BCGI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Really. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Oh, you know, it's a straw poll. You don't need a motion. Oh, Madam Chair, I uh, suggest we have a straw poll. I suggest we have a straw poll to find the, <laughs> find the amendment from the member from Brattle Road favorable. Thank you. Very charming team. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyone need to say anything else before we vote? Okay. Representative Andrews. Andrews, yes. Anthony. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was here. Brennigan? Yes. Demerell? Yes. Maslin? Yeah. Maddox? No. Bodie? Yes. Sims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Canfield? No. Kornheiser? Yes. Thank you. Just wait for her to thank you. Unless it's about the numbers. Let's Nine, two, okay. one. Okay. Thank you. Representative Maslin? Yeah, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's very helpful. Great. Thank you all for your patience on us getting here. Um, did you say 921? Yes. Two. Um, so in a moment, we are going to hear from Representative Graining about her amendment to 687. By the end of the day, I will remember that bill number. Um, maybe. And then we will be done until we just randomly come back here because we're called back here for an amendment. And before I forget, I want to let people know tomorrow morning, we are going to spend the entire morning, 9 to 12, um, in a joint conversation with the House Education Committee. And we're going to do that in the pavilion so that we can all sit at one table together instead of having a weird fusion Zoom one person hosting thing. Um, so we're all going to sit around the table in the pavilion 
Um, we're going to have all of the usual stakeholders also join us. We're going to start off with a um, sort of a standard outlook update presentation from um, Nicole Lee and Julia Richter. And then we are going to have a collaborative conversation. Um, the first question that we're all going to sort of answer as a group is what problem are we trying to solve here? Because um, I think everyone's on. I think that's an important question to answer before we dive right in. Um, Cause I think everyone's calling something a crisis, but it's not even, it's not clear to me anymore that we are all defining that the same way. And so as both committees together, we're gonna start with that question and go from there. So um, the time to bring your ideas and your curiosity um, both to the table. So um, it's really hard to have a collaborative conversation in a committee room um, and sort of feel open to brainstorm. Um, I, I know that every idea we throw out on the table um, has tremendous impacts in the field, um, even just having the idea. And I really want us to be able to find a way towards a real um, deep process conversation about what needs to happen. And so um, hope we can all try to balance those two things tomorrow morning together. Um, and That's now we're just gonna- 270. Okay. And how about I mute? Yeah, we're just gonna mute and hang out. Maybe we can hear some more of Carl's terrible quotes.
Muted. Yes, um, we are back in the Ways and Means. Oh, we've been in the Ways and Means Committee all this time. We were muted. We are unmuted. We are going to hear Representative Draining's amendment to 687. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you um, making the time for this. Um, I'm assuming, do you have 2.1? Because we have a brand new version. That's right. Yes, I yeah. posted and put it under Seth's name, but I'll change that after. Okay, Next. great. Um, so I presented in Energy and Environment. Did I get the order right? Energy um, this morning, Environment and Energy. Thank you. I've never gotten it right. And I yes. reference them almost every day on the record. So. E and E, I was there this morning and we had a lovely discussion about this. And the point is to... Um, allow for mixed use in the spaces where there were in the one B tier, where there are 50 um, units of housing that are um, exempted from Act 250 um, so that we can have, you know, in the spaces where the towns want it, we can have people live and work together more closely and build more densely and build in a more community fashion situation. Sorry, just like I said, had a piece of cake, a little sugared up. It's <laughs> okay, <laughs> we all are. We haven't even had sugar. So, so, um, so we had a discussion about it. And after the discussion, um, some of the language was changed, but the gist of it is still here. And so um, do you, want, you don't want me to read it. That's, but that's, I, I don't know that there's any financial impact at all to this. Um, I don't know what else I should say. That's good. Okay, and they voted it. They they liked it. Um, eleven zero zero. Oh, um, anyone have any questions? No. Representative Anthony? Does this have the effect then of saying in a residential area, mixed use is permissible, notwithstanding local zoning, etc.? No, it does not. It's okay. all about the zoning, and the town has to say that this is what they this want. This is okay. To yes, I got it. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. <clears throat> um, thanks. Thanks for um, explaining. We're gonna, I'm going to ask Ted, but you're welcome to sit there while I ask Ted. To, do you have any idea if this is, does anything no, for no, money? Not yet. Okay. No. Okay. Um, it's okay. Do you have like a gut, a gut on scale? <laughs> um, <laughs> Such an awkward position to put you in. Yes, and I would have to just like wrap Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, well, this is the fifth time this has happened today. I still feel unclear about the best way to proceed. Um, do folks, other folks have an opinion on whether we should proceed or not? Um, it's very uncomfortable not to talk it when we don't know what the fiscal impact is. Um, I think we could say it's unclear what the fiscal impact is and decide not to take a position, or we could say it's unclear what the fiscal impact is and decide to take a position. I don't have a strong opinion in one direction. Representative Andrews, what's your opinion? Um, well, I am happy to go on the record to say that I think Representative Graining's um, amendment seems uh, like a really positive step forward. If we don't know the impact, I would prefer that we defer and not vote. That's great. That, I think that lines up well with how I'm feeling about the whole thing. Thank you. Okay. Um, is anyone desperate to take a position? No, I just concur, but I support where you're going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, Representative Demro, um, the speaker won't call on you if we right. don't take a position, but yep. just in case she does, yep. you get the gist? Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we are done in this room. We have a caucus of the whole now about the budget. We're on the floor at one. We have a lot of bills on the floor. We have third reading. We have some second readings. Um, we might come back here. And then tomorrow at 9 a.m. we're in the pavilion. And